through. Okay, so this is the art of teaching and it's an energy-based approach. I'll tell you a little bit about how the approach has evolved over the years with different inputs um, later on in the webinar. I'll give you an overview, first of all, what's going to happen. I'm going to, first of all, take you on a guide to the webinar system, um, just to refresh the memory of the three courses of you who've been on one before and, and just to introduce the system to those of you who are new. Um, we'll also find out a little bit about you as a group. We'll then move on and we'll look at what makes a successful teacher, obviously with the emphasis on shiatsu and energy work. Then we're going to look at how to plan a lesson or course. Look at the theory and practice of teaching adults, because that's what we're mainly doing when we teach shiatsu. And then we're going to look at creating uh, creative ways of engaging students with uh, different learning styles. And we'll talk a little bit about learning styles later on. So we've got a bit of an action packed hour ahead of us. <laughs> and then finally, we'd like to just share some of our experiences of using energy work techniques in shiatsu. And this is a very special part of kind of the work we do. We've been developing over the last 20 years, which is actually using scanning and other energy work techniques actually within teaching. OK, great. So <laughs> this will then lead on. And we'll tell you a little bit about our online teacher training course and the residential that we're running next year, which we're, we're going to open up with a specific uh, stream for teachers, which is a bit of a first for us for a, for a little while. Right, this is how you can participate. <clears throat> it's very interactive, these webinars, um, and there's various ways that you can uh, interact. Um, we're assuming that you're connected up with your mic and speakers. And you'll find that there's a box that you can type questions in. And, and Connie, who's next to me. Hello. <laughs> well, she'll be monitoring the questions, the text questions, and she'll be nudging me if she thinks that I should be answering some of them. Um, so that's one way that you can ask questions as we go along. And you'll find that uh, question box in your control panel. OK, and then even more exciting, you can actually speak to us and speak to the whole group. Um, if you're going to do that, though, you should make sure that you have got a headset and that your audio is sorted on your computer. Um, and then you can then put your hand up by clicking on the little putting your hand up icon. And then Connie will keep her eye open for that. And then if we find someone putting their hands up, we'll unmute you. And then you can ask a question uh, using audio, not just texting. OK, so that's basically how the webinars work. You notice that you're muted at the moment. That's nothing personal. That's just normal because we can't have like 100 people all unmuted because it would just the system wouldn't be able to take it. We have to have um, we have to have everyone muted unless you're answering a question or if you're or unless you're a panelist. OK, great. So let's just go on and to the next screen. And I thought it'd be really fun to find out a little bit about the group, about us. So uh, Connie's just launched uh, the next poll, which is to find out where you are. OK, so let's see if you'd just like to vote for that and we'll just see where you are. Wow, almost all from North, uh, from uh, Europe today. But some from North America and some from South America. OK, any more, any more, any more people want to vote? No, it's 90 percent voted. We've got 89 percent from Europe, including the UK, 7 percent from North America and Canada. Hello over there. And I don't know what time it is over there, actually, but going to be sometime during the day and then the same with South America we've got four percent none from Africa and Asia and Australasia this time which is unusual usually we have quite a big scattering of, of, um, of participants okay great so now can we find out something else about you let's see yeah how long have you been involved in chat so let's find out how experienced you are as a group <clears throat> so if you could just check on the box and we'll just see what kind of experience level we have Right, any, more, any more more voters? Wow, this is very interesting. We've got 18% one to five years, 25% six to 10 years. That's And we've got 36%, which is our biggest single group, 11 to 15 years, 11% 16 to 20 years, and then 
another 11 percent 21 years or more so we've got a very very experienced group here by far the most biggest majority of you have got over six years experience and a, a largest group of all 11 to 15 years so whoa that's amazing that's okay nice. i think there's just one other poll there about the teaching let's just have a look and see what that is um who i think it's that one who are we what are we yeah that's it one more poll if you can bear it i'd just like to find out whether what we are who we are <laughs> who are we just like to find out whether you're a head or founder of a shiatsu school a shiatsu teacher a trainee shiatsu teacher or assistant a teacher not in shiatsu or other maybe you're just uh, maybe you're a shiatsu practitioner who's not involved in in teaching so let's just have a look Oh, OK. OK, look at this. We're getting some very interesting results coming in now. Anyone else like to vote? Ah, OK, this is very interesting. 40 percent are in the other category. So you're not a teacher of any sort at the moment anyway. Um, but we've got, again, a large, I've got quite a few heads of or founders of schools. So welcome to coming along to this webinar. Um, but the bulk of the group seem to be shiatsu teachers or trainee shiatsu teachers or assistants. So welcome. That's that's great. That's great. And we've got 40 percent of teachers who are not shiatsu teachers. So that's very interesting in itself. And it'd be very interesting to get your feedback on this webinar. And as a, a professional teacher who's not a shiatsu teacher, um, I'd be interested to, to hear what you know, what you what you feel about the work we're doing in uh, energy work teaching. OK, so without further ado, let's go. Uh, let's go and uh, get into the webinar itself. OK, so we found out who we are and found out where we are and how long we've been involved in Shiatsu. OK, teaching and learning. <clears throat> Here's a little table that I put together just to give an overview of um, the, one of the major themes in teaching and learning. And that's to do with whether the teaching is teacher centred or learner centred. And this is an age old debate that goes way back to the time of Lao Tzu, Confucius, Confucius and to um, Socrates. And it's a debate that's been going on and still very active today. Now, in Shiatsu, we've got an interesting um, dichotomy in the way that it's the teaching is developed because we've inherited um, like a master pupil relationship type of teaching method from the East, the traditional um, method of teaching, which is quite teacher centered really. The master is the model for the students. Um, but we've also, because of the way that Shiatsu developed as part of the growth movement in the 60s and the 70s, we've also interestingly got quite a lot of learn centered uh, or process based um, teaching input from that kind of whole growth movement that happened in the 60s and 70s and that's what's given shiatsu and energy work teaching its unique kind of mix now the difference between the teacher-centered and learner-centered approach is that the teacher-centered approach is all to do with transmission the master knows everything and it's basically a transmission from the master to the to the student whereas with learner-centered or growth-centered or process-based approach really what the teacher's job is to just to provide a, the right environment um, to facilitate learning uh, in the learner um, and this is again a debate that's been going on for hundreds if not thousands of years so we've got a traditional system which is also combined with a more contemporary approach and in technical teaching uh, te teachings teachers speak we have Teacher-centered uh, curriculums tend to be content or product, so they're more involved in what's actually going to be transmitted or what you want the student to actually be able to do technically at the end. Whereas a learner-centered approach is much more process-driven, and that's where we have in shiatsu teaching and energy work teaching, we have the whole idea of self-development and self-awareness that comes from that that approach. So we've got an interesting balance there between traditional and contemporary techniques okay so that's kind of background as you can see the the whole um subject is a massive a massive one and just to, just to give you a little bit of um background of my my um background in teacher training 
I actually taught shiatsu for about 20 years without having had any formal shiatsu, um, any formal teacher training at all. I just copied my own teachers and just did the best I could with what I've learned from them, very much in the transmission model. Sorry to interrupt, Cliff. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little louder or turn your microphone? Yes, sure, yeah. I'll turn up my audio. We've had some... Some people yeah, not just, hearing. Um, Nils has said that she can't hear you too clearly. Okay, I'll I'll um I'll just uh, turn up my microphone. Hang on a minute. There we go. I'll just turn it up a bit. Hopefully that will sort that out. Yeah. yeah. Okay, That's is that better? better? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, great. Thank you for that feedback. Right. That means I don't have to shout as well now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my own background in yeah, I, I was uh, I taught shiatsu for over twenty years, uh, just basically copying my own teachers. And it was only when I I, was, I actually did a PGCE in a further education train uh, teacher train training in the UK because I was given a job teaching music in a uh, FE college, and I did a two year PGCE, um, a post compulsory education PGCE, which means it's specifically for teaching adults. And I found it really quite a revelation. I had no idea just how much material was out there and what a deep subject it is that touch. It touches all kinds of things, psychology, uh, even therapy, philosophy. I mean, it's really a, quite a fascinating area. And um, as a result of that, I really became enthusiastic about um, basically put inputting teacher training into the shiatsu world, really. Um, so... This first theme that we have, and this is the theme of week one of our five week course, is what makes us a successful shiatsu teacher. OK, <clears throat> well, there are basically three main areas um, that tend to come out through research and through exercises on how we experience a successful teacher. And that the. They consist of firstly the subject knowledge or expertise, which is the first thing we tend to think of. The second thing is actually teaching skills, the actual techniques of teaching. And the third one is personal qualities like empathy, enthusiasm, um, ability to inspire students and things like that. And we've got an interesting energy work based exercise in week one of the online course to do this. But I thought it might be interesting just to get your opinion on the matter. So we've got, I've got a poll, we've got a poll um, sorted for this, which is, yeah, which of these three do you think is the most important thing? If you had to choose one thing that was, was the most important thing, do you think it would be subject knowledge, teaching techniques and skills, or the personal qualities that for you makes a successful teacher? What do you think? Be interesting to see what you think. Now everyone's really thinking hard about this. <laughs> wow, this is interesting. I can actually share the results. You can at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah that would be interesting to do that. Wow, here we go. Look at this. 73% of both. Some of you are still really thinking about this, I can tell. <laughs> wow, this is just in so interesting. Okay, we're going to have to close it up. Anyone else want to just... Yeah, look at this. This is just so fascinating. By far, the biggest voting was for actually the personality, the approachability, the enthusiasm, the empathy of the teacher. That's absolutely... Incredible. And funnily enough, I was talking to my daughter who's just started high school just this, this September. And I was asking her about what she thought made a good teacher. And she said, do you know, she said, Dad, she said, I think it's about half the person or even three quarters the person and what they're like and only about a quarter of what they tell us about the subject. <laughs> and that's broadly in line with what, <laughs> what we've come up with here. We've actually got nearly 60% of you voted for the actual approachability enthusiasm of the teacher. And I think that's something we've all, we've all experienced. And then teaching techniques comes up higher than subject knowledge and exp expertise. So that's very interesting. That gives us an idea of what we should focus on when we're trying to develop ourselves as teachers. First of all, <laughs> developing our personal qualities in, enabled to, in, 
being able to support the students and to be able to kind of connect with them and then work on how we're working on our teaching skills. And then only after we've done those two, we should start thinking about our subject knowledge. So that's really interesting, isn't it? Okay, and so we've done the poll. <clears throat> All right, I've got a joke for you. Hooray, about time we had a joke. And do you know what? I just checked on YouTube. And do you know my joke, which is on YouTube, which I made on my phone in 2007, has now reached 7,000 YouTube hits. It? It's, yeah, 7,000, I couldn't believe it. Okay, it's a shame it's in such it's such poor quality. I actually did it on a Sony Ericsson phone in 2007, well before we had flip cameras and everything like that. Okay, this is how the joke goes, right? This is a teaching and learning joke. It's a famous joke, so you may have heard it before. Uh, there's two people walking in the park, walking their dogs, and uh, one says to the other, do you know what? I've, uh, I taught my dog to whistle today. And so his friend says, oh, really? Oh, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. Can I, can I hear him? Can I hear him whistle then? And uh, so the first one says, oh, no, no. So the second one says, well, well why not? Well, why can't, why can't I? And so the first guy says, well, I said I taught him how to whistle. I didn't say he learnt it. <laughs> oh, <God>. Okay. <laughs> Have you not heard that before, Connie? No. Con All right. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a hit. Connie, Connie's <laughs> obviously not one of the 7,000 people that's checked it out on YouTube. Sorry, <laughs> Yeah. And that's a class. That is a classic teaching and learning joke. But it has obviously got a, like all jokes has got a very serious side, which is when we when we uh, untrained teachers are famous for teaching. In other words, for trying to just get what they know out um, to the students. And in actual fact, successful teaching is really very, very different from that. And the emphasis is completely different, as we'll find out. Um, in the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Okay, so that's my joke. <laughs> okay, so here we go. And now I've got how to plan a lesson and a course. Okay, and this is where the teaching and learning joke really comes in handy because dun, 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 the first thing that usually happens when we're not trained in how to plan a lesson or course is this. We think of the content. We think of what we are going to cram into those students in the time available. And in actual fact, um, as you will know, if you've if you've um, had any teacher training, the first thing that they that we taught is that actually the process is completely different because what we need to do is we need to find out what the aims and objectives are. We need to think about where we want the lesson to go at the end. OK, so rather than thinking of all the content we're going to present to the students, we think about what do we really want them to be able to do or to know at the end of the session. And then the second thing is we have this word assessment. And what that really means is how are we going to find out at whatever level we're assessing students, the learners, how are we going to find out whether they've got anywhere near reaching those aims and objectives that we set up for the lesson? And then the third thing we tend to do is we think of what resources are we going to have? What are we going to actually have with us in the classroom in order to be able to design the teaching and learning methods? OK, now <clears throat> this is we'll find out later on in this presentation that also one of the big things that uh, we tend to always do as teachers is we tend to always assume that everyone learns in the same way that we do. And that's pretty much a universal um, error that teachers make and that's why teacher training is so important because what we need to do is get out of the, our own heads and think about how different people learn in different ways. Um, Cliff just yeah. to stop you a moment now we've got a question from yeah. Sylvia yeah. Um, would you be okay to take that question? Yeah sure okay what does it is it a hand okay, up or is a it a hand up. Hand so up. Okay. I'll try unmuting her and see yeah. if she's there. Okay great. Let's just see if we can get through. Hi, Sylvia. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Thank you very much for coming on, on air. Yes. Uh, just can you go through again uh, resources? I, I couldn't get uh, what you said about resources. OK, sure. Yeah, I'll go back and I'll just say I'll just uh, go through that again. OK, resources. Yeah, OK. Resources, that's actually a, a really, a really big subject in itself. 
as we'll find out later, one of the big resources that we often use when we're teaching adults, and we'll find out about the work of Knowles and andragogy and pedagogy later on, is we actually use the students group or the learners themselves as a resource. Um, but teaching and learning resources basically covers everything from whiteboards, blackboards, skeletons, books, um, anything that you use within the classroom or within the workshop environment to aid the learning. And you can make these things up, you can bring them in. Lots of teachers I know have huge crates full of all kinds of things, plasticine, you know, colouring crayons and things like that. And the resources are very much tied in with the teaching and learning methods. So basically, once you've decided on your teaching and learning method, then you'll integrate that with the resources. Yeah? Okay. Is that clearer now? Yes. Sylvia? Yep. Okay, yep. great. Thank great. you. Great. That's great. Yeah. Um, and if anyone else wants to come on and uh, I'm just ask gonna meet you again, Sylvia. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there here we look. Here we here's the process. Aims and objectives and assessment form the beginning and the end of the uh, session. It could be a course or it could be a, just a one lesson or one session. And then the resources and the teaching and learning methods are how we get from here to there, you see. That's the idea. <clears throat> okay, and then we have sequencing, which is another, another issue, which is basically what are we going to put first and what we're going to put afterwards. Now, obviously, that can be very important because sometimes you need to know something beforehand before you can learn something else. Um, there, again, there's a lot, a lot of study and research been done on the whole issue of sequencing. But at a basic level, we do, we do that even within one workshop lesson. So these three things here, are like what are we going to use, what kind of methods are we going to create for the learners, and what kind of order are we going to do it in? So all these things come between these two and they construct a lesson or even up to a whole course. It's one thing I haven't mentioned, and that's evaluation, which is the final stage, which is finding out um, how everyone felt about the whole process. Um, and that's more something that we deal with when we do course design. We've got another module coming up, a five week module on course design and assessment, if you're interested in, in going further into course design. OK. <clears throat> How about this? This is one of my favourite philosophers of science, Paul Feyerabend. He was somebody who I studied when I was at university. Um, and I quite like this quote. I thought I'd put this in. The best education consists in immunising people against systematic attempts at education. <laughs> and I think the theme of that is really about trying to keep learning and creativity alive within any kind of system. And I'm sure we've all had that experience where we've taught a course maybe several times um, and we really want to keep the whole thing alive. And teacher training and being in a group of teacher trainers who are developing themselves is a great way of doing that, just keeping the whole thing, the whole thing alive and everything. Okay, so now we just move on to another theme of the online course, which is the whole idea of teaching adults. And this revolves around the work of someone called Knowles, um, who's a very famous um, philosopher and uh, developer of teacher training methods. And he was the one who first came up with the idea of andragogy um, as opposed to pedagogy. Um, before Knowles, there was no real proper idea or differentiation between teaching children and teaching adults. And he was the one who really developed it as a separate study. So the idea is that pedagogy is for children and andragogy is the idea, the concept of teaching adults. Um, something that we're all probably aware of being in the shiatsu uh, world and that's that motivation is different for adults. The adults that come to study shiatsu are almost invariably intrinsically motivated. In other words, their motivation comes from inside, they're self-driven, um, whereas a lot of the teaching that goes on with children is extrinsic and it has to be because they're in a way forced to be in school. Another thing that we notice about adult learners is they tend to be self-directed and that can reflect very much on the way that we design the lessons because we can use all kinds of different types of teaching and learning methods that may not be appropriate for younger kids, such as project-based learning, where we allow the learners to have a lot of control over what they do and they're, therefore they're more likely to 
to get deep learning because they'll be working on things that they're interested in. OK, so once we've um, had an outline of our course and we've got some ideas about uh, how to work with adult learners, we can also take a look at learning styles. And we've got a, um, a week in the five week course um, based on learning styles. Now, as I think I mentioned earlier, one of the things that uh, we t always tend to do is we tend to assume that everyone has the same learning styles that we do. And if they don't, there must be something wrong with them. <laughs> this is the general, <laughs> general attitude that can build up. Um, but in actual fact, there are many, many different types of ways that people learn. And if we want to really reach all of our students and we want to really inspire them and get them to reach their highest potential, it's really worth knowing about something about uh, learning styles. So one of the things you can do is reflect back on some of the teaching you've done recently and especially things like theory. Have you always presented it in a similar way or what the way that you tend to learn the best? Here's a very simple system that we often use on lesson plans, the VAC system, and that stands for visual, auditory and kinesthetic. And that's a useful way of just looking at lesson plans and just seeing whether we are dominant in any one of those three methods. Here's, an, here's just an idea of where um, theory, which is usually like a cognitive type of experience, goes over into more of a kinesthetic experience. And that's Masnag's and Meridian expressions. They're a classic example of that, where the theory, Shiatsu theory, is expressed as a kinesthetic experience. And in the Shiatsu College, Paul Lumberg and Dinah and myself, um, as well as Nicola and Carla, over many years have also tried to extend that experiential approach to theory into TCM and other areas of theory. And we've had you know, a reasonable amount of success of bringing that into the experience of the, the students. So that's something you, know, you might want to think about. Think about the traditional way that you always teach a certain certain part of the syllabus that you're teaching and see if you can shift it into a different type, a different uh, approach, a different uh, way of the students can experience it. Someone's asking if we can see the learning styles again. Right, OK, yep, here we go. It's actually a it's actually a massive subject in itself, learning styles. And there's whole this this uh, you may have heard of uh, multiple intelligences by uh, a guy called Gardner. That's another fascinating area of um, of study, which is that there are different types of intelligence, and that we can appeal to different uh, facilities within a student. The trouble with traditional learning is that it always tends towards the rational and the cognitive. I mean. In a way, we're quite well insured against that by the very nature of shiatsu teaching, because quite a lot of it's obviously going to be kinesthetic experience, experience that is um, practicing the physical techniques. But it's worth looking out for a tendency within any curriculum or any syllabus or even in lesson plan to turn the experience more into a traditional cognitive and visual and auditory experience. And if that happens, it's really quite an interesting and creative area to think of using other resources and other um, learning styles. Oh, we should mention, by the way, that we're actually recording this webinar and hopefully we'll be able to put it um, on the Internet for you to look at later. OK, so let's uh, let's go on. We've looked at that. OK, so let's have a look at this. Have a look at communication theory. OK, <clears throat> now this is where it really gets interesting. I'd just like to um, talk to you a little, little bit about the background to the work that we do in teaching um, communication of, and transmission of experiences within energy work. And this goes back, my, my experience in this goes back to the early 90s when I was working with Pauline Sasaki, we were doing developing a teacher training curriculum um, for the European Shatsu Institute. And what we did is we were invited each year to do work with the teachers. And during that time, over a period of about 15 years, 
we developed a range of different techniques um, that we found we could use to teach energy work. Um, the main problem or one of the main issues we have with um, teaching energy work is that because we're dealing with interactive energy fields, the presence of the teacher themselves within any kind of situation will influence the energetics of the of the situation. Um, and we've got some models that we've developed, which I'll show you a little bit later um, on how we've worked to try and get around and turn that to an advantage by using energy work techniques. OK, look, <coughs> this is conve uh, conventional communication theory. Um, what that usually involves is uh, a communication is a transmission of information from one system or one person to another. Whereas with energy work, we're much more interested in resonance. And that's the whole idea that there's a communication, a direct communication, like a phase connection between either the student and the model they're working on or the teacher and the group. It's that whole idea of setting up a resonance as part of the communication, uh, which is something we've really worked on and which we find very interesting. Interestingly enough, it's something that's used traditionally in Qigong teaching and uh, tai Chi teaching, where you get that whole feeling of the of the room, of, of the energy in the room getting into phase. And the teacher basically sets up a resonant field in the room that the, the students uh, take part in. OK, look, here's a here's a communication models uh, in diagrammatic form that I put together. And this is the top one. You'll see that a lot in books. You see that a lot in teacher training books and other books about psychology and things like that. The idea is, is that information is sent from the teacher to the student by some kind of method. Obviously, what's received by the student, it will be <coughs> affected by all kinds of um, different factors, their preconceptions, their previous understanding and things like that. And also how the teacher presents it is going to be influenced again by a lot of different factors. And that's another massive area that a lot of research has been taken, uh, been, has taken place on. It's a very interesting area. Just that whole idea of preconceptions on the part of both sides of this information transmission. But we're also working with a, another model, which is um, this resonance model. And the idea between the resonance model is that the teacher and student actually share an experience more in an energetic space where they become in phase with each other. So in other words, they become like one kind of system. This part here becomes like one kind of system. Now, we can use that type of method where we use modeling techniques. Uh, that's where what we do as a teacher is actually um, create strong a strong sense in our field of what we'd like to communicate to the student and that's picked up through a direct experience of resonance. Okay now the thing is it gets a lot more interesting and a lot more complicated um, once we get into a teaching mode <coughs> and we're dealing with teaching something like diagnosis or superlocation or tuning into a meridian. And the reason it gets a lot more complicated is because of this. OK, we have a simple model here of giver and receiver uh, with a resonant space, which is represented by this overlap. But you can see how much more complicated it gets as soon as we introduce a third person into the relationship. So here we have giver and receiver happily working away in class. And then what happens is the teacher comes over. Now, look what happens. The number of potential interactions suddenly multiplies. And what we use in our notes is we use this abbreviation to show the interactions between the teacher, the student and the receiver. OK. Now, probably one of the um, biggest mistakes we can make as a teacher is to assume that this area here, in other words, what we pick up on the receiver, the HARA diagnosis, for example, 
is going to be the same or even should we say it should be the same as this area which is the student's experience of the receiver. Now <clears throat> if we're uncritical about what we're doing and we think that the HARA diagnosis or the energy pattern of the receiver is a fixed thing not an interactive thing then we can easily be drawn into this whole idea of assessing the student's perception directly against our own, not taking into account a very important aspect, which is the interaction between the receiver and the teacher, the receiver and the student, and the teacher and the student. OK, and I'd like to tell you a story about how I discovered how important this was. And it happened many, many years ago when I was teaching for the Shiatsu College in London. What happened was we paired up the group and there were odd numbers. And the class assistant, who is now a famous teacher in his own right, Nick Pohl, who was a class assistant in that group. And because we had odd numbers, um, I paired up the group and Nick was with one of the students well what should happen was we they all did the diagnosis and I went round and I checked you know the diagnosis and everything everything seemed fine and then I remember that the student had given Nick some kind of quite vulnerable diagnosis like heart meridian curve something like that okay so I could see that they were you know they'd opened up and there was a good interaction there and then what happened was one of the students who was always late, that always used to kind of wind up the group a bit because she was late, came in late just when they were about to start working. And what I did was I took Nick off the student and put this person who'd come late onto the, st the other student. And then I stood behind her. I tried to make myself as you know quiet as possible. And I observed the Hara and it completely switched to liver jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, I knew that this was going to be a disaster in the making here because I could see that the reaction, the higher diagnosis actually represents the reaction. So then I took the, the student off the receiver and I put Nick Pohl back on again and I got her to just observe. And that was such a dramatic experience for me of seeing how the higher diagnosis and how the higher diagnosis is so determined by the interaction that I never forgot that. And I took that into um developing some of the teacher uh teaching energy work techniques so how are we going to help our student develop their hara diagnosis or their energy perception receiver well there's various different ways that we can do it what we don't want to do is to tell them that this is the right one <laughs> and that if this is different they're wrong <laughs> And the reason for that is two. One, it just shows that we don't really know what we're doing. And also it totally undermines the confidence of the student. What would be much better would be to explore this space here. And what we've developed in the teacher training, in our teacher training courses, and we're going to be sharing these at the residential next March, is we found techniques where the teacher can concentrate on sharing this space here, particularly this space here, with the student. So what we're doing essentially is we're making ourselves more invisible and tuning in through the student and experiencing what the student is experiencing of the receiver. Once we've done that and we've put this aside, what we can do then is we can enter into this space with the student by again by harmonizing and by resonance with them with them and then we can support them that's not to say that we can't that the student's always right but what they're perceiving is always going to have a validity and an integrity because that is the reality of their perception so our role as a teacher is to try and expand and develop this interactive space rather than showing them what we're feeling, telling them that it's right and telling them to come into here, <laughs> which is, you know, which is always, a, it can, can be a temptation. 
And then we've developed lots and lots of techniques to do that. Some of them involve going into this zone here, tuning into the student, maybe adjusting their alignment, adjusting chakras, different um, areas of contraction and expansion within their field. And then we can monitor this space again and see what effect our work, energetic work with the student has had on their perception. What we can do with more advanced students who are very confident is we can briefly enter into this space. We may pick up some patterns that the student is not aware of. We can then go back here, work with the student again, again with their alignment, um, and then check in again to see whether this space is starting to resemble this more. In other words, whether this space has got bigger. Again, we've got a whole range of really, really interesting and very enjoyable techniques that we can work on um, that we've been developing over a number of years to be able to do that. OK, so and that uh, we're going to introduce that in week five of the five week module, which starts tomorrow. We have actually got a few places left on that course. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've got some terrific resources, we've got an, a fantastic video in week one um, of Sir Ken um, Robinson, who's one of my favourites, and he's uh, He's going to be, uh, we've got a fantastic TED video embedded in the course that you can look at. And what we've done actually, uh, because we've got a few places left, is we've actually opened up the course for guests at onnewenergywork.com, which means that you can go and just, you can just hang out with us in the first lesson, see if you're interested and uh, stimulated by the course. And if you are, then you can just join us for the next, um, the next five weeks. Okay. So let's uh, go on a bit more. OK, look at this. Confucius, reviewing what you have learned and learning anew, you are fit to be a teacher. Now, isn't that interesting? You see, that's a, a very, obviously a very, very old <laughs> saying. But look at this. Confucian learning is always fully connected to self-transformation. So there was Confucius extolling those virtues of self-transformation, self-reflection, all those thousands of years ago. How about this? Here's a few, just a few of the influences that feed into the online course courses that we've got. We've got one starting tomorrow, which is on teaching and learning, and we've got uh, the art of teaching, and we've got another one uh, next year after the residential on curriculum and course design. That's another absolutely fascinating area, again, that's been an area of debate and controversy for thousands of years, as you can see by some of the influences that we've got here. We've got Confucius and Lao Tzu, both of whom had some very interesting things to say about teaching and learning way back, as did Socrates in the West. And then we've got some people we've mentioned today, Knowles, who started off the whole and, uh, andragogy and pedagogy debate. We've got Skinner, who you may have heard of. He was uh, a behaviorist and he's influenced one particular very strongly represented form of curriculum model which is quite influential at the moment something that's really worth knowing about if you've ever had to do any competency-based work might be worth finding out about that that's more in the curriculum development course um woo <laughs> sorry just press the wrong button and um, we've got carl rogers one of my favorites obviously famous for his work in therapy absolutely brilliant on education, some fantastic writing from Rogers, and he's really one of the modern um, uh, proponents of self-directed learning. He's really terrific on that. And his ancestor in that self-directed learning would be uh, Rousseau, who, again, had a lot to say on education and really, again, laid the foundations of the whole idea of self-directed learning. And of course, our dear teacher, Pauline Sasaki, put so much energy into um, working on developing energetic techniques. And perhaps her teacher training development work is not so well known and publicised, actually, as her, as her shiatsu work. And as I say, I was lucky enough to work with her for over 15 years developing a teacher training curriculum based on energy work techniques. So there's lots of material there. And this is just a selection of the people who have all contributed toward, to, the, to the whole idea of whole ideas of what education and teaching mean. So it's fascinating. It really is a fascinating, and very deep subject. Um, Cliff, could you just go back to the last slide with the quote? Yeah, thank you. OK, yeah. Just someone wanted to have a another look. Yeah. yeah, I'll read it out again, if you like. 
reviewing what you have learned and learning anew, you are fit to be a teacher. And the notes on that are the Confucian, in, in, according to Confucius, learning is always fully connected to self-transformation, which is a very interesting thing, isn't it? Lao Tzu is another very interesting philosopher in terms of education, as you can imagine, because he's so closely associated with Taoism. And in the curriculum and course design uh, module, the uh, art of course design, uh, we, we actually we've got a lesson on that or a week on that traditional uh, Asian, traditional Asian and modern uh, lineage of teach, uh, course design. So there we go. OK. Sorry, I must have sped through that a little bit. We've only got 10 minutes left, actually. The time's flown. The hour's flown past. So if you've got any questions at all, please do um, uh, ask them in it, whichever way you want to. Put your hand up and we can hear your voice or you can type them in. Um, we have a question from Verena, um, and I think actually it's quite a valid question for everybody. Yeah. And it just says, would it make any sense to do the course without having a group to work with as a teacher or assistant? So I guess what she's getting at is if you're not yeah. planning on going ahead to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of self-development, it's still going to be a really positive thing to do. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you've got a teaching group or even if you're thinking of putting a group together, it would probably be, you know, really worthwhile, a really worthwhile to, thing to do. I mean, um, that I mean, it's something that I think it's worth considering doing if you're a shiatsu practitioner, because that's a traditional thing that shiatsu practitioners have done is to hold, is to run small groups, even if you're mm -hmm. just going to run even just an e one-off evening, or do even if you're going to do a presentation, just a simple presentation. Uh, I think you'll find it invaluable because what it'll do is it'll give you all kinds of ideas for making that presentation interesting. And also the main thing about anything like this is it'll allow you to avoid the classic mistakes that we all make if we don't have any input, you know what I mean? So yes, have a look. Well, the best thing to do, uh, Verena, and anyone else who's interested is just check out the course. If you go, I've opened it up um, for guests uh, today. I, I've um, sorted out the first lesson it's worth checking out because the the video um, is is very very funny. Um, it's one of my favourites, and it's a, to do with education and creativity. I think one of the biggest sort of things I'd like to share with everyone, if you haven't done any formal teacher training, and actually we could we could maybe ask them. I we, I've got I've got a poll there about. Um, uh, let's see. Oh yeah. Yeah, OK, let's let me ask you a question. Let's find out how many of you, um, if you are a teacher trainer, if you're a, a, a shiatsu teacher, an assistant teacher, an assistant or any kind of teacher in the shiatsu world. Um, could you just let us know whether you've got a teacher training qualification from outside shiatsu, like a formal teacher training qualification or whether you've got teacher training within shiatsu or you've got no formal teacher training? Whoa, OK, look, I'm really glad I asked that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Like we wouldn't expect everyone to vote anyway, Connie, because not all of them are teachers, are they? So let's just yeah. give them another minute on, on stuff. And we'll just... OK, so I think we'll close Yes, we'll close it. Do you want to publish the results? results? So look at this. We've got half, 48%, basically half of all the shiatsu teachers' assistants and assistants and teachers have no formal teacher training. Whoa, okay, start tomorrow, people. Join up on our course. <laughs> <laughs> you know it makes sense. Uh, I'm, seriously, though, because I've been in that position for so long and I've taught shiatsu for so long and I was successful. I have, you know, I mean, I was successful. I mean, I did teach a lot of workshops and things like that. It was a complete revelation to me to do teacher training simply because... I had no idea of how much material and resources and really the whole richness behind um, behind it. And it, I think I had a certain amount of arrogance as well. I think a lot of us can fall into that, you know, the, because we're successful within our own small world. We just think, well, what can I really learn about teaching, you know, teaching and stuff like that? Well, I have to say it completely transformed my whole approach mm -hmm. um, and it's made and it's really revitalized my my it's re re revitalized my teaching really 
over a number of years and it continues to do so because you know you're always reflecting just like Confucius said you know so what have we got 30 percent 30 percent have actually got an outside teaching qualification so that's actually quite a substantial amount probably PGCE or something like a certificate of education that's pretty good isn't it um and only 22 percent teacher training within shiatsu interesting yeah okay great right. right. and we've yeah. got um a couple of questions so all right one question is um and i guess uh, karen means if you're in a teaching setting yeah what about asking the students what they want to learn yes yes exactly yeah that's that is a more that comes more from the learner from the learner centered approach that's the sort of thing that carl rogers would love to do um and if you if you've got a copy of that book um, on becoming a person uh, by Carl Rogers. It's quite a famous book. It's just a paperback book. If you've got that on your bookshelf somewhere, check out the chapter which is entitled On Education. It was an absolutely fascinating account of how he was booked to do um, some teaching at a university and basically he just sat there and did nothing <laughs> and just held the space. And it's quite extraordinary because what happened as a result of that was that the students eventually took over, taught themselves and went off and researched themselves <laughs> so that's it well he he applies the same sort of thing to his counseling theory doesn't he exactly yeah that's right Which with the counseling been a part of those groups and it is bizarre but it's very effective yeah that's right yeah exactly yeah so yes sure um obviously there's uh, you can only do that to a certain extent if you've got a curriculum to cover like if you're actually teaching at a lower level um and we've got to cover material that's got to be examined and things like that there is a limit to how much you can do that um but generally speaking the andragogical approach is much more based on that it's much more uh, learner centered and it's something that i always do when i'm teaching advanced workshops i always ask the group if there's anything particular that they'd like to cover because that gives them ownership of the material and you get a completely different level of engagement mm. You know, and then really this teacher's job is really to facilitate that learning rather and facilitate where the learner wants to go, where the learners want to go. And we've just got one last question, which is a great way to finish. Um, okay. And more is wondering how we can participate in the first lesson. Yeah. So if we just tell them a bit about new energy work. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, um, what I'll do is I'll just do this. We've got two minutes left and I'll just show you. Okay, we've got the art of teaching online starts tomorrow. Um, and it's open to guests for the week for week one. All you do is you just go to newenergywork.com and just check in there. If you have any problems logging on, just contact us at admin at newenergywork.com or you can just phone us. To set up um, an account if you're not already a member. You but would. That's very straightforward. Exactly, yeah. But you can actually, as a guest, you can just go in and have a look at it okay. anyway, just as a guest. If you do just decide to join the course, you'll have to you'll have to have a login set up. But if you have any problems with that, it's very straightforward. We can always uh, help you. In fact, if I get a chance, I've got a minute or two left. I'll, I'll just show you uh, what that's like. Um, yeah, and next next March, if you're interested, we've actually got a residential. We've got a three-day residential near London um, in a beautiful house, Oxenhoath. Um, and uh, Nicola's going to be there. Annie's going to be there. Diana's going to be there. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be teaching a lot of the energy work approach then. And if you want to go deeper into course design and assessment, that's for any of you who are assessors or anything to do with course design or anything like that. It's one of my favourite subjects. We've got a five week course on that. OK, so let me just see. This is something that uh, you should never do, by the way, anyway, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to actually go live on the Internet and see if I can show you what, how to get in here. OK, this is the New Energy Work site. You get there by just going on to newenergywork.com and you can hopefully see that. You see, I'm not logged in at the moment. OK, so I will see what you see as you go in. And what you'll see there is you'll see the art of teaching. Look, just right there. Oh, okay. the line's going a bit funny, Cliff. What is? The line. The... I can't hear it anymore. OK, possibly because of the Internet. Let's just, yeah. just stick with it. Yeah. OK, that's better yeah. now. Yeah, po possibly because I'm doing. OK, so if you log in as a guest, you will see this. This is what the lesson looks like. OK. And you can just click on any of these things. This is my favorite. This is a video by Sir Ken Robinson. I'm doing this just to show you. You see, there's the video. And you'll be able to just click on there. And it's an extremely funny video. Very, very thought-provoking video. 
Okay, so that's how you do it. Very, very simple. We've got a fantastic um, virtual learning environment at newenergywork.com. It's the same that they use in a lot of universities. Very easy to use, and we have all kinds of resources. It really is a lot of fun. Okay, well, I hope to see some of you anyway um, on the online course tomorrow. And if not, just keep in touch with us. Make sure you've got a login on newenergywork.com. We'll keep you informed of any new uh, free webinars. We've got loads more coming up this year. Um, thank you very, very much for taking the time to check in uh, with us. And thanks for all your questions and thanks for your engagement on the polls. It's been really, really uh, fun sharing some of this stuff with you. And uh, yeah, hope to hope to meet you soon. Thank you.